All right, welcome, Catherine. Um, thank you for joining us today at the Star Haven Arts and Science Symposium. Um, we are looking forward to watching your session here about flat gilding, and this is part one of a two-part session. Um, so thank you for joining us today, and I'm gonna hand the microphone over to you. Thank you. So in order for an illuminated manuscript to be called illuminated, technically it should have gold because illuminated means bringing light to something. And so in period, gold was added to a manuscript primarily in three different ways. So the first way was with shell gold, and that's the earliest of uh, applications. So shell gold um, was powdered gold, uh, ground very, very fine, and then kept in a shell mixed with gum arabic and it was basically gold paint. And so it was applied from, from the earliest manuscripts all the way through the later manuscripts on, on top of paint, on top of gold, that was the most commonly used. The second method that was developed is called flat gilding. The third is raised gilding. The difference between the two is what you use under the gold. So gilding is extremely simple. That does not mean it's easy. You take your parchment, you put something sticky, you put gold on top. That's all there is to it, sort of, kind of. So flat gilding uses what we call a sizing. It's a bodiless, sticky substance. Uh, you can use garlic, garlic juice, except that it never quite dries very well. You can use glare, beaten egg white. Um, the recipe that I use is a gum arabic size uh, with sugar, gum arabic, and a little coloring, but it doesn't add any body. Raised gilding uses a, a gesso instead of a size that has a plaster, very fine plaster, slate plaster added to it. Um, it's usually kind of a milky white, whereas size is usually a red or yellow and it is able to be burnished. So it has uh, usually some lead white in it, usually um, slate plaster, uh, sometimes Armenian bowl, but you're able to burnish it. You're able to press it down with something very smooth and make a very hard, smooth, shiny surface, which allows the gold to really pop. So I'm gonna switch over to my little uh, camera here and show you an example. So these two pieces, and the lighting is obviously just right. This one is flat gilding, this is raised gilding. You can see that this is almost a mirror finish, whereas this, no matter how much I burnish it, will never be quite as shiny. Um, um, one of the things I discovered is the idea of raised gilding, you don't have to have a thick layer. So if I move my finger across this, I can't even feel the edges. And I looked at a manuscript in England um, a number of years ago that had raised gilding, and it looks like it's raised, but in truth, it's buckled. Yeah. So if you were to put a really thick layer of gesso on your page, if you flex the page, it's going to crack. That would not be a good idea. Works great if you're doing like a, a scroll or something that's meant to be mounted on a wall, but in a book, you don't want something really highly raised but you can get that same effect from something very flat, minimally raised, because it buckles on the back. That's why it looks raised. So if you're doing raised gilding, you don't have to put six inches of, of gesso on there to get that effect, even a tiny, tiny layer, because you can polish the under layer. You can't polish the sizing or everything is gonna get stuck together. Um, manuscripts, that we have the talk about, um, that's backwards. I'll switch over this way so you can see the titles. Um, Theophilus is one of the earliest people, oh, that's backwards too, sorry. I hope you can read that. Um, On Diverse Arts talks about um, gilding and he gives several recipes. Um, our most famous Chinini uh, also talks about gilding, but more about the raised gilding. Um, all in all, if you're really into gilding, my favorite book is The Gilded Page, where she looks at all of the different 
sources for gilding information, um, puts them together, even has recipes, um, some of which work. She has one recipe using Elmer's glue. I did not get that one to work. <laughs> um, so why mess with perfection when Shanini's recipes work just fine? So those are useful sources if you want to go there. Um, so I use, <coughs> she was made by Eric's daughter and now she's uh, Melise, no, uh, Maeva became, I'll think of her name in a minute. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Her recipe, which is a redaction of one of those recipes. It's the recipe that's been around forever uh, with a couple of modifications. So the basic ingredient is gum arabic. Um, I discovered you, so gum arabic is hardened tree sap from the acacia tree. And you can buy it in its powdered form from art companies. You can buy it already mixed from uh, Windsor Newton. You can buy bags of pebbles from uh, John Neal or Natural Pigments. Or on Etsy, you can buy a huge bag full of big chunks uh, for about a quarter of the price. Same stuff, you just have to smash it yourself. Um, so that's what it looks like in its raw form. Um, in its powdered form, it's just powder. The recipe that I use calls for one part of gum arabic, one part of sugar, and you can, I use castor sugar or um, super fine granulated sugar just because it dissolves faster. Um, you can use natural sugar. I've used natural sugar, but that turned into a solid hard lump. Um, so this is just easier and faster. The recipe in Kathleen Whitley's book or other places calls for one part gum arabic, one part sugar, four parts water. Don't ever do that in Florida. It will never work. So I use uh, one part of gum arabic. Uh, wrong bowl. There we go. Snap this way. Hello, camera, where'd you go? There we go. All right, and then one part sugar. Which is all lumpy, come on. Well, sort of. And then a tiny bit of coloring. You can use red or yellow. Um, red was more common, but I have seen yellow and just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. And this is Armenian bowl. When I make it, I generally kind of do a double boiler thing where I put really, really hot water on the bottom because I can keep reheating the water underneath. I've never tried microwaving the, just I'm not sure I like that idea. So then I need two parts water, and this is hot. So gum arabic is also found in candy. Um, it's still used, you can get it sometimes at like a, a health food store or a nature type store. So the trick is dissolving this stuff. And it takes a while. And that's why I keep it in the hot water. It dissolves faster if you use more water, but then it's too thick to use. Uh, in Florida, we have enough humidity that, yeah. Now, one thing that I have found with this solution or this stuff is it never works when I make it. <laughs> However, well, I won't say that. It works maybe one out of every three times. However, I have a nice little jar with old stuff. In fact, um, last time I taught this class, there was a big funky looking cloud of stuff floating in the middle of it, and I just strained it into a new bottle. So this, some of it's a year old, some of it's a year and a half old, and some of it's three weeks old, four weeks old. Um, and it works like a charm. So this 
Can you, I'm sorry, I, I missed how much water you used. Two parts, so okay. uh, one part of gum arabic, one part of sugar, two parts water, works best in Florida. Uh, this one could use a little more colorant just because I um, used a different one. I don't worry too much when I'm stirring it here to keep the bubbles out because I'm going to strain it. And I strain it through a nylon stocking. Probably the best use for nylon stockings in Florida. All right, that's looking pretty good. Now, eventually bubbles are like your worst nightmare, but at this point, yeah, I'm not too concerned about it. It still feels grainy. So I'll let that sit for a few minutes while I go to something else and then I'll come back to that. Um, okay, so this is your basic size, which can sit for a little bit and make sure it's all melty. And then I'm going to strain it into a little jar with an island stocking. One thing I have discovered about uh, this stuff, it magically seeps out of any container you put it in. <laughs> Every single bottle, paint bottle, water bottle, container that I have put this stuff in, it has managed to leak all over my art bag. So from now on, I'm putting this bottle inside of another bottle because uh, I'm tired of getting the sticky stuff out of my art bag. It's getting annoying. Um, okay, so once you've got your gesso, you need gold. I tend to use genuine 23 karat gold leaf. I have used artificial. I hate it. Um, I've used all kinds of stuff. I've got some double leaf gold. I've got some silver. Um, colored, I guess it's white gold. Um, I just like the real gold. It plays much nicer. This is called patent gold because it's attached to the backing sheet and you don't have to go chasing it around. Nice. Uh, be very careful not to sneeze. Don't turn on your fan no matter how hot your hat flash gets. Please make sure your air conditioning is off and you will still get gold everywhere on your dog, on your cat, on your ferret, on your whatever. Um, it's just life with gold. But this makes life much easier. Um, so I start with a design. Um, this is just a template of one that I send out. Um, so if anybody wants a kit of stuff, this is what I'll send you. This top goes to this jar. Okay. So, um, the easiest way to apply your size is with a paintbrush. Figure out which paintbrush is for size and keep it for size and you only use it for size because once you put size on it, you will never get it off. You can rinse it, you can clean it, but it will never quite be the same again. But you know, that's life. Um, so try not to go from one to another. The trick with applying the size is you start kind of with a puddle. I don't know how much closer I can get in on that. And then you tease it to the edges. So you don't paint it like you would gouache. You just kind of tease from the puddle out to the edges. When you need more, you put your paintbrush down in the puddle and keep teasing. The most important thing about applying the size is that you want kind of that bubble effect. So let me see if I can, when I hold it to the light, oops, spot, you want to make sure that you don't have any little glitches. So there we go. 
So you want that evenness. But do you see how this one is darker on this side than it is on that side? When I set it to dry, it wasn't quite level. So unlike calligraphy, which is best done on a slant, you really need to do this on a flat surface. The second most important thing is patience, which I don't always have enough of. Um, you have to let the gesso dry, and that's why I kind of built in that um, window of time. Because if I try to gild this now, when I put the gold on, the sizing is just going to bleed up through the gold and make a mess. So you've got to let it dry. It's best if you put a very thin coat, let it dry. Put another very thin coat, let it dry. Put another very thin coat. If you put a thick coat, it's not going to work. First of all, it'll probably bubble your paper or your parchment, um, which can happen even with several thin coats. But it won't dry evenly. And so when you try to put your gold on it, it's going to all squeeze through. It's really a mess. So I'm going to put that aside. Try not to stick my hand in it and leave it be. And try to rinse off my paintbrush. So this stuff I think is looking pretty good. Or not. So basically when I'm ready to strain it, I just take a nylon stocking. Poke a hole. Oops. I'm going to use a glove on this just because I don't want to have to wash my hands. And then I just pour it into the stocking. And it won't go through. So you just squeeze. That way there's no lumps. So this one's a slightly different color than the other one because I used Armenian bowl instead of alizarin crimson or whatever I used on that one. And so now my gesso is ready to paint. I make it in little tiny batches. Um, I think the original, somewhere I saw something, it's like, you know, half a cup of this, half a cup of that, that'll last you and the entire kingdom for like a year or two. Um, so you really don't need to make much at a time. Um, you can use Jerry Tresser's gold size. This is if you um, do a lot of work for the kingdom, um, the College of Heralds will give you some of the gold size. It's okay. I, I just like the, the stuff better. Um, this stuff over time tends to separate, tends to get a little bit granular. Um, I found that if I stick it in a cup of hot water and, you know, swirl it around a bit, it melts a little bit back down, but this just makes my life much easier. All right, so adding your um, size to your paper. So this is kind of the, the stop point so people can kind of do their own with me here to help. Do you want me to just do this second? Oh, can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, just go on to the next part. Julia Child did for me. Okay. All right. So I did this one. This has two layers from early this morning. And you can tap gently. I think we're all good. This one is only one layer. That's pretty dry. I'm not even going to mess with that one anytime soon. Okay, so you want to make sure it's good and dry. Um, otherwise, like I said, stuff gets all sticky stuck. You want to cut your gold into manageable size pieces. If you're using artificial gold, you have to cover the whole thing because artificial gold will leave seams. Real gold loves itself. It's called... Um, I can't remember. My brain's not working today. Um, so it loves itself and it will stick to itself. So when you press one layer of real gold onto another layer of real gold, 
you won't be able to see the seams. It will mush itself together. Uh, the artificial gold does not do that, uh, which gets to be a pain. Um, so I found when I had surgery a number of years ago and they took some stitches out, I got one of these little tweezers. Uh, they were just going to throw out the whole set. So I said, can I have those? Uh, they're really nice because you can grab the gold and it doesn't go anywhere. Um, this gold is so fine that if you get it in your, on your fingers, it will give you gold fingerprints and trying to get it off is not going to happen. Um, and it's certainly not usable. You also want a waste jar. And I have too many of these to tell what's going on. Uh, this is very useful because you can make uh, shell gold out of the little bits and pieces so you're not wasting anything. The sugar in the gum Arabic, so the, in your gum Arabic, bleh, sorry, in your gum Arabic recipe, the gum Arabic is the sticky part but it does dry to not sticky. The addition of sugar is hydrophilic. It loves water. So when you breathe on your gesso, the top layer that gets your breath is gonna turn sticky again. You don't want all the way down to the bottom sticky again or it's gonna mush. You want just the very top layer to get sticky. So that's what the sugar is for. So I just cut these little pieces of gold and they're gonna be in my way. If I move over here, come here. It helps, I find, to work on a surface that has a lip, if you can see, because then you can grab stuff by sliding it off. Trying to pick up a very flat piece of gold off a very flat surface doesn't usually work. So you can use a number of things to breathe on the sizing. Um, I have a piece of gardening bamboo, used to be attached to a rose bush. Uh, I just cut it, cleaned it out, washed it carefully. You can use a straw. Um, for classes, I use little plastic tubes that came out of uh, doggy pickup bags. Washed, of course. Uh, the new pickup bags that I've been getting come with a little cardboard tube, which I like better. Um, you can use a toilet paper roll. The plastic, like a straw or tube, the problem is over time, the moisture builds up and then you're likely to blow a drop of water. And if a drop of water hits this, it is, yeah, just stop right there. Um, so anything like the bamboo or the cardboard absorbs enough moisture that it doesn't happen as easily. So the first trick is to blow on it now. Um, I have had pieces that I put the sizing on and then left to sit and a year later I've been able to gild because the gum arabic and sugar doesn't change. Um, however, you gotta love Florida. I have some little kits that I made to send out and I gilded or I put sizing on one of the pieces so that that would be already done. Only the paper sticks to it. So back to the drawing board on that one. So. You've got your blowing tube, you've got your gold. <coughs> the other thing you need is um, glassine paper. So you can order it by the roll. On Amazon, I think I got a roll for under $20. Or you can just go to the post office and get a stamp envelope, which is made out of glassine paper. The glassing paper is going to protect what you're doing when you try to uh, press on it to make sure that things are not escaping. So <clears throat> I always start, when you breathe on it, you wanna take a deep breath from the bottom of your lungs so you get a good amount of moisture in there as well. And you can see by the gold flickering, it's a slow, steady breath. So I'm doing this one here that has one coat that I did this morning <clears throat> and it's fairly dry. Then I just put the gold on top of it and press down very gently. I'm not going to burnish it anytime soon. Um, I'm not even going to do more than just 
gently press at the edges and then I can take away my paint. I keep these little scraps because they're perfect for patching up any little holes. So I'm going to try this one here. So get my gold. Gotcha. Get my gold again. Come here. And just smack on top. Now you can see on this one, you see the little tiny mark right there. See how there's a little dark spot? That's because it didn't catch. And the beautiful thing is that gold loves itself. Now, when you're doing raised gilding, you can put three or four layers of gold on top of the sides and it's just going to keep layering up. Flat gilding in general will only accept one unless you have bleed through. So I can't tell right there if it's a hole or if the sizing pressed through. So I'm just going to stick another piece on top. I'm going to breathe just to make sure. And then using the corner, I just layered another piece on top. And then you wait. And the longer you wait, the better. Um, a trick that I have found, I have trouble sometimes getting my edges clean. My modern sensibilities want pristine, clear, clean edges. Medieval sensibilities didn't care about that. You just go around it with some ink and nobody knows the difference. So one of the tricks that I do is I breathe down the side, getting under the gold at the just at the sizing. And it's perfectly got fine if the gold folds up on itself because it's just going to stick to itself. <coughs> so crossing my fingers and hoping it's dry enough. And if it's not, I'll just stick some more gold on it. I put the glassine paper over the top and I start just barely with my finger. If the glassine paper sticks, I know that the sizing has bled through, and then I've got to put some more gold. This feels pretty good. It's not sticking. I still see though, you can tell a little bit better on here, that there's a little discoloration there and one right there. So just not sure if that's bleed through or if that's something. I'll just put a little more on top. Something stuck. Any excess is not going to kill anything. Let me start our glasses. Right there at the edge. I don't know if you can see. Right there. There. I can see a little bit of surface showing through. Yeah, I'm just gonna keep smacking gold on it. I can just keep layering all this gold and anything that doesn't stick is just gonna be brushed off into the gold jar. You can remove all the excess gold by rubbing it with bunny fur, which you'll need later anyway. I prefer doing it with a paintbrush. So I have a couple of gold only paintbrushes. And I always do it on a piece of paper. Because I want to save my loose gold. One of the things I learned early on is you've got to be extremely gentle and almost tease the gold off because too much force and you're either going to put hair lines on the gold or you're going to just scrape it off. <coughs> so 
so I have my little gold jar. And at this point, you will, I promise, get gold everywhere. I try to save all this extra gold. And it does a little get stuck to the glassine paper. That's why you need plenty of it. So I'm just going to kind of tease with almost no pressure, just the edges. This one has several layers, so I'm trying to make sure any of the loose edges of the layers comes off. So that looks like it did pretty well. Put all my little loose gold on here. And then just folding it and trying to funnel it. You can't really see, sorry. Just, I'm just trying to funnel it in here. Something like that. Sometimes this little straight brush works better. Sometimes this one works better. If you don't like the effect you're getting, try the other brush. Um, you can use a rabbit fur, you can use cotton ball. I've seen different recommendations. My favorite for flat gilding is a cotton ball, or I'm sorry, is a bunny rabbit fur. Um, for raised gilding, either silk or cotton works a little bit better, but on flat gilding, for some reason, the silk or the cotton leave scratch marks, whereas the bunny fur doesn't. You can burnish, it's not really as necessary with um, an agate head burnisher on this, but you wanna make sure that it's totally dry, like right there, it's not. So that one's okay. No, it's not. So this one right here got stuck um, a little bit so you've got to be really careful. If you're going to burnish it with an agate burnisher, I would wait 24 hours before burnishing it. But the bunny fur you can use a lot sooner. And you're just polishing up the surface. Unless, of course, you press right through, in which case I think I just did. But because I'm using real gold, if I don't like it, I'll just slap another coat on top. Yeah. So you can kind of see this one here has a little rough patch right there that I'd probably put another layer of gold on. This one over here is looking pretty good. But it's always going to have kind of a, not sparkly, but a matte texture to it, whereas your raised gilding will get a much more polished look. But it's not complicated. It's not hard. It just takes a lot of practice to get an effect that you like. Um, and you just layer on if you need to. And then you can go over the edges. You can outline them again in ink. Now you can also play around a little bit here. You can apply it with a quill. Generally, a writing quill is cut so that the curve is over your hand. When you apply sizing or gesso, you want it cut the opposite direction. But you can, well, let's go to crease them a little bit, um, do the same thing where you just dab it down and then tease it where you want it. And some days I like a quill better, some days I like a brush better. Um, I never know what I'm gonna like better that day. 
I think it's a little easier to control the quantity with a brush. So you can also write with it. So I have a regular writing type quill with a broad head, which may or may not work today. And I can write, oops, not working today. Let me see, yes. I can very carefully write with this. Be better if I used one that was darker. So I don't know if you can see. Oh, the bee didn't come out. So I'm, I wrote ABC down there in letters. And that can also be gilded. Um, I put my paintbrush. Got a little too much. On it, or a little too much. I'm trying to suck out a little bit of it. So if I wait a little bit, I can gild over that. Um, so anything, any questions, anything other than, I have to wait a few minutes before I gild that. Biggest problem for me always is patience. I always want to like gild it now and it's like, no, I gotta wait until later, 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 later. Um, I think it was so revelatory when you got to look at the real one and determine that this oh my gosh. raised gilding was not really raised. You right. know? I could exactly. go back and redo some things in the past, you know? Yeah, that was really fascinating. And then I try, I've been playing with different uh, raised, uh, raised gilding modern pieces. Um, so I tend to make little samplers so that I can play around with different ingredients. Um, like I've got the same thing on uh, Bristol and on Perg. I've got some, I was playing with different flat gildings but they weren't working out right. Um, I don't see the other ones, but I usually do some kind of little sampler um, and I'm getting better about writing down, you know, how long, how much. Um, there are different kinds of gold. I've got some Chinini weight gold, which is double the modern weight. Um, I've got some white gold. I've tried artificial gold. And at this point, I have no idea where the artificial gold is because I've shoved it somewhere because I got frustrated with it. Um, I have loose gold, but I haven't quite gone that crazy with it. Um, just too many tools and too many different things. All right, let me see how badly this will turn out if I do this. That sticks. I didn't wait long enough. But anyway, you can write, um, and it does come out pretty neat looking um, when you do the chrysography in gold leaf as opposed to gold ink. But yeah, I didn't wait long enough. Oh, hi, Evan. Looking up at the computer now, seeing you there. <clears throat> 
Hello. So, um, that looks like time. And Evan's next in here, so we'll Yay. make the switch to her. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, thanks. Thank you, Catherine. That was fun to watch, too. Thank you.